this is gonna be more of a story based because I'm gonna be talking about my experiences. So additionally, I, after seeing the trigger warnings of some of the other talks, I would like to say that this, in addition to bullying, also sexism and negative social interactions at work. Um, I also wanna say pronouns she, her, hers, and feel free to take pictures and film the talk. Uh, I guess I'll be public also, feel free to tweet me. Let's see if this works. So hi guys, uh, y'all. Uh, my name is Adina Shanholtz, and by day I am a technical evangelist for Microsoft. Uh, that means I am a developer who goes and speaks to other developers, but for once, I am not gonna actually be focusing much on my job. But if you do wanna talk tech with me about mixed reality or virtual reality, game development, or uh, open source technologies in the cloud, we'll talk after. Um, but before I looked like this, I looked like that. And ooh-wee, uh, no wonder the kids bullied me so much in school. God, that haircut. But let's be serious. Um, for a second, uh, the way that the school dealt with, with this scenario was, let's send the kid whose parents don't run the PTA to therapy. And you know what? It's a good thing that they did, because I learned a whole lot about social skills as a you know, kid with ADHD. And thinking back, back on that experience now, God, I cannot believe some of the stuff I thought was okay to say, like, wow, and also like had to teach me how to make eye contact with people, because that's a thing that I wouldn't do very much had a lot of other things to look at. Um, so, you know, all of this stuff leads to my talk title, which is I'm Sorry I Can't Stop Saying Sorry, which I wrote because when I first started my job, my first big industry job, uh, ah, apologies, uh, wasn't in the frame. I also didn't want to stand too much, but I like to walk. Uh, when I first started my first tech job uh, at Microsoft, I basically had a lot of very negative social interactions with my coworkers, I would say sorry a lot. And a lot of times it's because I interrupted a lot. It's a thing, if you look at like things that people with ADHD, they interrupt a lot. They're also impulsive. They have a lot of other things and I'll get into them, um, especially my things. So I would interrupt my coworkers a lot because I just had a thought that I had to say and then I would be like, sorry for interrupting. And they would say, stop saying sorry so much. And I'd be like, but I gotta, it's social protocol. What are you talking about? This doesn't compute. Uh, and so I, it made me feel like an alien. It made me feel like I didn't know how to have positive social interactions with my coworkers. And it was very uncomfortable. It, it led to uh, a lot of negative productivity or lack of productivity and a lot of other things, I'll get more into it. Uh, but I just felt like people really needed to understand where I was coming from. People needed to understand that the apology was basically me apologizing for my inability to read social cues correctly sometimes. And it's more than just, you know, I, I'm apologizing for the sake of apologizing. It's I am expressing to you that I am not following the proper social protocol. Let me, like, let's create a bit of understanding. But it wasn't the case. And I'm going to, all of this talk is going to be about advice that either you as individuals or your workplace can keep in mind for making a better and more productive environment based on my experiences. So, creating opportunities to foster relationships. Um, I guess it's a good thing that I'm going as the last talk because I'm gonna be touching on a lot of things that other people talked about. Uh, so it's very difficult to interact with my coworkers when there's work pressure involved. When I first started, I was sent to a lot of student hackathons, which means a lot of weekends and 72 hours of driving to and from Boston, where all the colleges are, to go and lead hackathons. And I mean like eight weeks in a row type of thing. And it was after having like enough negative social interactions with my coworkers, Workers, it, I spent like a whole car ride, like I had to go and put my headphones on and like cry inside because I felt like I couldn't interact with the conversation that was being had in the car. It was just so painful for me to feel like such an alien in this environment. And it would have been better if I had had a chance to connect with my coworkers just a little bit on a personal level if I'm going to be put in these environments where I'm going to have to talk about 
things that are not tech. And you are going to talk to your coworkers about things that are not work. It's inevitable. And so creating these types of environments is really important and would have definitely increased my uh, happiness with my job and my productivity. And so uh, doing this in certain environments is also something important to keep in mind. Not just happy hours. God, I went to a lot of happy hours when I first started. And I don't drink a lot of alcohol. I, it makes me feel sick. I can't, and there's other people who have their own reasons that they can't do it. Not only that, but the environment is harmful for me. I just can't, I can't deal with bars. It's loud, it's a lot of, it's weird lighting, it's hard to make, continue to make eye contact and he, literally hear people. I have to shout, I lose my voice every time. Everything leads up to, I literally just need to leave. I just can't deal with it. And how am I supposed to get to know people in this environment? It's, it creates a terrible environment for me to interact. So one of the best experiences I had with bonding with these coworkers was uh, someone else came into town and demanded that we do escape the room. It was so much fun. We had to work together on team building exercises without it feeling like working on team building exercises. Also, working on team builds, like terrible team building exercises is a great way to bond over having to do that. Like that's a thing that everyone can bond over. Also, like, go zip lining. It's fun. Like, go do a ropes course. Not everyone could do, a, obviously, an active fit ropes course, so that was hyperbolistic. So, next thing. Give as many perspectives as possible. Why did I stop saying I'm sorry so much? Well, short answer, I went to the West Coast, and they told me, don't do that, instead say thank you. It was the best advice I could have gotten. I had basically bit, okay, did you know that San Francisco culture is different from New York culture, tech culture, in terms of the, the tech industry and the people who work there. Like, West Coasters, what do we think of them? Yeah, pretty chillax. West, in terms of Silicon Valley, what do we think of them? Like, gotta work on my app. Hey, have you seen my app? New York tech industry, what do we think of? Like, busy New Yorkers, gotta like get everywhere, gotta do everything on time. New York tech industry, it's actually pretty chill. There's like a lot going on, a lot of different stuff going on. So obviously, just in love, in love like stereotypes alone, there's going to be different perspectives. And so I learned a lot from just going to my, to my coworkers and telling them like, here's some of the stuff I'm struggling with. And they're like, how about instead of saying, I'm sorry I took up your time, you say, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. And I still do that to this day. I bother my coworkers so much with the smallest problems and I say, thank you for your time. And I still say, I'm sorry I interrupt. And it helps to mitigate those types of things, but without going and experiencing different things, I would have still felt, I wouldn't know what to do. I would have still felt this disconnect with my coworkers. And without having as many perspectives from different types of teams, like, you know, it's, it's good. It's good, it helps us be round, well-rounded people. Also, this is a feminist issue. I'm sure as soon as you saw, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, you thought, women in text, apologize too much. Okay, well that's true, it's not even just about that. My issues. I don't follow social protocol. I am blunt. I say it like it is. I, do, I, I am impulsive. I, I interrupt a ton. And also, I'm oblivious to everything around me. Uh, I also can't play the game. I don't pick up on subtle social cues very well. So if there's like, what they really mean is you need to read between the lines, Adina, and I go, I can't do that. I don't, if you don't say it, I don't understand it. So these things combined, are actually, with, with the playing the game thing accepted, these are actually pretty masculine traits. These are things that we think guys do. They interrupt and they're oblivious and whatever. So when I do them, I, it's, it's weird that a woman is doing these things and I'm treated differently. I have a story of exactly that. So I was with a, a coworker, a former coworker, and I was, it was in a group, I was asked a question by someone else. I start to answer the question, and he, he's gotta interrupt me at every five seconds to mansplain my answer. And I, I, I don't take well to that. And so, eventually I just say, shut the F up. Obviously with not as nice language. So, and then in the stunned silence, continue to actually explain what, what I was asked, of course. 
but he wouldn't take it. He said, no, he demanded an apology. He refused to let it go. He said, no, I demand it. How dare you treat me this way? And I tried to ignore him, brush it off, but he wouldn't take it. I have to apologize for being me. If it was a man who did that, come on. Like, it would have been like, wow, I was just put in my place by an equal. And it's, no, it's how dare she do that to me. It is a feminist issue that I am being read a certain way, and I have to apologize for being me for the way that these actions are coded. And I really don't know what to do about it. I have no advice here, because this is just something that we have to work to change. This is just my story of how I struggle with this, I guess. So on top of this, be patient, because I took a long time to ramp up. When I graduated college, I graduated with a double major in computer science and East Asian studies. That doesn't go well together. Obviously, when I joined and they said, you have to have a thing, a technology thing, I went, oh my god, what do I do? There's so many things that I could have. I could go into machine learning. I could go into app development or you know, web development. There's so many things I could have picked. I had no idea where to start. And when I did start, I didn't know what I didn't know or what I had to learn. I need structure to, to, to do that. And when I am in this and when I'm skilling up, it takes me a bit longer to learn it. But Here's a bunch of things that I have done since then. Also, I have learning disabilities. That's a talk for another time, but it contributes to it. I need a bit of patience and understanding. The top thing is a serverless function that creates glitch art. Um, it's pretty cool, and that's like the default Windows XP desktop that's glitched. The second thing is a VR, learning VR curriculum with Google Cardboard. It's like the first app, first type of app you could create. The last one is a game called Silent Dream, released on Windows 10 and Android. And it's a game, it's out there, and I've made it. And it's cool that I've been able to create all this really cool stuff in my job since getting up to speed, but it's needed time and patience. And in that, I found that if you play to everyone's strengths, you'll get so much farther. Everyone learns differently and everyone has their own thing. And so it takes different types of thinking to be able to make the most impact, to create the best product with the fewest problems, to reach the audiences you need to reach. It doesn't matter what it is. The difference in perspectives really do help. So in the context of my team specifically, as a technical evangelist, we have to go to communities and speak and reach audiences. Uh, I am here with my my mental thing, and you know, I'm talking to the other comp audience, not because I'm a woman in tech or whatever, but because I have other perspectives that have shaped my life and enriched my life and allow me to do what I do. And that's a thing that my coworkers didn't have, but it, it takes this type of differ differences in self and personality and types to be able to do what you do. And so in this, Another thing as, as tech people, so pair programming is what I do. Like it's where I do my best development. If you, you know, we have the, the thought of, you know, the typical developer go, you should lock them in a room and they churn away at a problem all alone, talking to no one, then they come out like, oh, so exhausted, but look at this thing I did. That is where I do my worst programming. Uh, it is also really hard to find people to like regularly pair program with because so many people just want to be left alone and work on a problem. But I think by speaking, and not to the rubber duck, I think by speaking and getting like, I, it's like a thing, I, I really, my professors told me to do it, and it never works for me. I need, I need, uh-huh, uh-uh. Like, even like if it's fake, like I really do need that. Um, or blah, 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 this thing, right? And then just be like, right, or not right. Just even just a little bit of like confirm or deny. Or here's a counter thought, and then we bounce ideas and make the product better. Teamwork makes the dream work, basically. So this has put me in amazing situations, such as a scenario where I was mob programming with the, the team that makes .NET Core, like, or .NET. If you're familiar with the .NET framework of, from Microsoft, brilliant people. In a room, I was driving, and they were, they were going back and forth and telling me to do different things. It was the best. Most people would be like, that sounds terrifying and like the worst experience of your life. And I'm like, nope, nope, that's where, that's where I shine. And so 
with all of this, I am speaking to managers mostly here. Assess what your team, or dev leads and managers. Assess what your team members need. People who are in a position to do more to help others. I needed a lot from my manager, and my manager's managerial style at the time was very hands-off, which worked for all my other coworkers because they loved being left alone to do what they do. But for people with ADHD, they need habits and structures and goals and a little bit of hand-holding, then you, they take off and they do great. So they continue with habit forming and they continue doing what they do. And I, when I started, I did not have that. I had irregular schedules and I didn't quite know what I was working towards because my job is a, kind of irregular and a little messy. You kind of have to figure it out as you go along. And so I eventually figured out what I was supposed to do Five months after I started, I kind of went, oh, I see the light at the end of the tunnel where I can eventually start being a decent technical evangelist. Okay, I know what I'm working towards. But it took a long time and a lot of visits to other teams and a lot of different perspectives to get there. And so just having, the res having resources for people even if it's create a bot if you have to, someone, something like automatic, like I need X resource, I need Y resource. It's also kind of hard for people with ADHD to keep things organized. And there's also when you have a lot of things to onboard on, it's really hard to keep track of things. So having a great onboarding system really helps. So with all of that, here's what we've discussed. Just a summary slide, in case you want to take pictures of it. So thank you so much. Feel free to find me on Twitter. I am Faye Technologist, F-E-Y Technologist, um, and I do cool tech things and teach them to people. So thank you.